and we can rejoice in the hope of sharing the glory of God. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Our assurance rests in the triune God who grants us new life. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Praise God. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained, obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to invite Xander and Annabelle and Pastor Patrice and Eddie Wilson to come up here and kind of join me here at the top of the stairs. So we are commissioning some very special part of our church family to do some very special work. Um, this trio is going to Malawi, and Pastor Priest is leaving in a day or so for South Africa. So I'll, I'll give you a second. I'm going to hand you a mic. Tell us a bit about what you're going to be doing in Malawi, and then Patrice, you can share about South Africa. Absolutely. Um, so Xander and Annabelle and I will be going to Malawi from July 2nd to July 18th. And we'll be visiting the Blantyre Synod, and it'll be one of the rare opportunities for youth from the wealthiest country in the world to visit and learn from youth in one of the poorest countries in the world. And we're excited for the opportunity. It's very much viewed as a pilgrimage and not a mission trip, but we're also blessed to be able to bring more than 10 suitcases of medical supplies and medicines to help with the aid from Cyclone Adai. 
and to bring toys from ELPC toy makers to the orphanages in Blantyre Synod. So we are very appreciative of the help from this congregation, all of your support, and we uh, especially appreciate your love, support, and prayers as we move forward. And this is part of the Malawi partnership, uh, Malawi, South Sudan, and Pittsburgh Presbytery. So this is the latest uh, iteration of that. And Patrice? And I will be leaving on Tuesday of this week with a delegation of about 13 or 14 other individuals um, as a part of my D-Men studies, um, spending time primarily in Johannesburg and Pretoria, South Africa, looking at social fragmentation and displacement in what is... Um, two very highly mobile areas. I'll also be visiting uh, a orphanage for children who have lost their parents to HIV AIDS. And I'll be um, also having the opportunity to explore some historic sites in South Africa. So I too solicit your prayers and support while I'm away. And so that's part of our next step here. So I'm gonna invite you forward to say here, I wanna invite the children to come forward to we're going to back up and join us here on the very top of the chancel as we have a few words and a prayer together. And the rest of you fill in on the friendship books, if you would. Sarah, bring them on up. We're going to come on up, guys. Oh, look who's there. All right, brave guys, come back, come up here and join me. How are you both today? All right, come here. Um, you guys come up and join too, Charlie. You're a big kid. <laughs> you can do that. All right, one of the things that we do when we gather in church, we talk about Jesus and we use lots of names for Jesus. We talk about Jesus as the Christ or the Son of God or Savior, Jesus as a good shepherd, Jesus as the light of the world. But one of the other words for Jesus in the Bible is Jesus as friend. Now to be a friend, you have to sometimes go forward and introduce yourself and say, hello, my name's Randy, what is your name? And the guys will say, my name's Nate, my name's Ellie, right? So that's one way to be a friend you have to take the step forward. Now, oftentimes, we're able to do that right here in church and on the steps, but sometimes we have to go a little further than that. And so, Mr. Wilson and Xander and Annabelle and Pastor Patrice, they're going to be friends by going over to different countries, and there they're going to meet people, and they're going to introduce themselves and say, how are you doing? But mostly, they're going to be sharing the love of Jesus by being with the others as friends. And they're going to learn from them about how Jesus has been in their lives and the love God has shown them. Now, this whole congregation is too big for them all to fit up here, but you all are just the right size. So, Ellie, do you want to grab Pastor Patrice's hand over there? Nate, do you want to grab your dad's hand? You guys come here. And you grab Nate's other hand. All right, you want to take mine? You guys want to hold hands here in the middle here? Yeah, actually, I'm going to reach right here. <laughs> you are here. You can hold it. <laughs> there. Even better. <laughs> All right, so what we're going to do is offer a prayer for our mission workers, our missionaries, these friends of Jesus going out into the world, and we invite you all to join us as well. So let us pray. Gracious and loving God, by your will we go out into the world with good news of your undying love. We go out to minister in the midst of human need, to tell and to show the wonders of your grace, to be a friend in Christ's name to all. So we pray for this group, for Eddie and for Xander and Annabelle and Patrice, who go to minister in your name in Malawi and South Africa. May they all be protected in their travels, strengthened in their work, and supported by our love and prayers. Do not let them be discouraged, but make them brave and glad and ever hopeful in your work and in the sharing of your word. Through Jesus Christ, may all God's people say, Amen.
All right, well, thank you all for being part of the prayer today. And we'll continue. If you can promise to continue to keep them in prayers in the days ahead, that would be the best way we can be a friend to our friends here. All right, thank you all. We'll see you next week. Thank you.
So the gospel lesson on this Trinity Sunday comes from John's gospel. This is from the 16th chapter, verses 12 to 15. Jesus is in the upper room with the disciples. He's washed their feet. He shared a few words. And then soon after this will come a long prayer before he leaves for the Garden of Gethsemane. So Jesus says these words to us today. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, the spirit will guide you into all the truth. For the spirit will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. The spirit will declare to you the things that are to come and will glorify me because the Spirit will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that God has is mine. For this reason, I have said that the Spirit will take what is mine and then declare it to you. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, loving Savior, Holy Spirit, descend to us once more that we might be your people transformed by your word. Draw near to us, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When people make an appointment to come and see me in my office, almost invariably it's about one particular topic. Now there are many things that we might talk about in our time together, We may talk about each other's families, about their health, what it's like to get older, about disappointments, challenges, and dreams in life. But quite often, we end up talking about one thing, and that's the difference between the words we speak in church and what people actually believe about Jesus Christ and about the Christian faith. For many of you, For visitors, for friends, for longtime members alike, there is occasionally a disconnect between what we say on Sunday and what you actually believe in your own hearts. And at some point, that disconnect becomes real enough that you call me and you ask to chat about it in my office. Now, before I go any further, before you get nervous and say to yourself, okay, he's talking about me, he's found me out... Let me reassure you that the questions about faith that you might have are all good things. Doubts simply mean that you take your faith serious enough that you choose not to be satisfied with superficial or shallow answers about God, about faith and life. And even if what you're doubting happens to feel like it's a big topic, like whether Jesus is the Son of God, I want you to relax because that is almost always the question everyone asks who comes into my office. In a nutshell, I'm actually happy to hear about doubts. My hope, though, is that you will not let these questions lead you to step away from the church, but rather that you see them as invitations to step into the joyful mystery that actually is the Christian faith. For thousands of years, a fundamental idea has been passed down from generation to generation. This idea that human beings flourish for a time and then we die and pass away. But there is one with whom we are in relationship who is eternal, who is the source of life, who is the sustainer of life, and who is the final perfecter of life. And so the best number if you're having to grapple with a big concept. And it's especially appropriate because today is Trinity Sunday. So, people first talked about God. God is creator. Over time and through experience, they began telling stories about Jesus, the Christ. Those stories were then written down into the scriptures. They were codified through works of art, sculptures, and even stained glass windows. And eventually, the language, the oral tradition, was then condensed down into creeds, catechisms, confessions. 
Words that we were told simply memorize this and accept them without question. But the reality is, we all do have questions. We wonder at times, where is heaven? Is there a heaven? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? Are miracles real? And if so, why does it seem they only happen to a few people? To answer those questions, someone might have come alongside you and said, well, here's what it says about that in the Bible. Or here's what the church has always said about that. But often, those phrases and answers are followed by an awkward phrase telling you, well, ultimately it's something you just have to accept by faith. I find that a a not-so-helpful answer. It's a phrase I rarely, if ever, use, and frankly, it's not a phrase that Jesus himself said. The passage I read from John, Jesus is with his disciples, and he literally opens the topic to them by saying, I have many things I wish to tell you, but right now, you can't bear them. You can't fully understand them. And that's why I said, I will then send to you a spirit of truth, this spirit that comes from God, and this spirit will guide you into what you need to know and understand including about me. So wrapped up in this little conversation, these few verses from John 16, is actually a preliminary expression about the Trinity. God being understood in three ways. God as creator, God as this Jesus, the Savior, and God as the Spirit of truth. In a fascinating way, the best option for grappling with a complex complex subject like one God is actually to complicate it further by talking about God as three in one. And so here's how it works. In our life experiences, creation is self-evident. And the fact that creation is wonderful and diverse and beyond our comprehension is something that all of us accept. And so to begin by talking about God as creator is actually a fairly easy introduction to faith. God is this divine wisdom that holds the world together with both mathematical precision and an artist's creativity. We set that aside. Then we recognize in our own life, we have times of inspiration. We have times when our conscious guides us in what is right versus what is wrong, when our gut tells us that maybe we should choose this over that. We recognize that we're more than flesh and blood, that we're more than just hormones and muscles, that there's something more to us, a soul, a spirit, a consciousness, and that part of us guides a lot of what we do. It certainly shapes our hopes and our dreams. And so it's not so hard to imagine that this human spirit is linked to that God, the creator spirit, especially if that God is a loving God, an active God, a God who chooses and wants to be engaged with us. And so God as creator links to God as spirit. But then what do we do with Jesus in this equation? Surprisingly, the one figure in the Trinity about whom we have the most concrete information is the one that we have to learn to see with the eyes of both wonder and of mystery. Yes, long ago, people encountered Jesus of Nazareth, this rabbi. And yes, to the best of our knowledge, he was brought before Roman authorities. He was condemned to die as an insurrectionist on a cross. And we have pretty good awareness of where that crucifixion actually took place. So for all that concrete information, to go further and talk about Jesus pushes us to the very limits of human language. And it pushes us sometimes to make a basic error. The conservative error 
is to emphasize, well, Jesus is the divine son of God, the eternal word made flesh, the one everlasting in the heavens, which has scriptural basis, but it makes Jesus seem distant and removed from our own experience. And the liberal error is to see Jesus simply as this human teacher, this wandering rabbi, this miracle worker and wise sage and benevolent social worker for the ills of this life. But the reality is to truly think about Jesus, we have to step back from the concrete enough to stand in a place of mystery, of awe, and of paradox, blending this eternal Christ with this human Jesus, blending this earthly form, human, with this Son of God who was raised from the dead. And so that's why the best place to start in thinking about the Trinity is actually to begin with the other two parts and move towards Jesus, rather than to try and start with Jesus and move from there to understand the triune God. Begin with God as creator, the creator who is active in the world through the Holy Spirit. And then imagine there came a snapshot of that loving creator's will and identity and mercy. And that snapshot occurred in time in the midst of our world. You connect them by thinking of God as perhaps creative power, the spirit as transforming power that came together in Jesus as saving power, healing power. Long ago, uh, the ancient church fathers grappled with how to put the mystery of the Trinity in words. One of them was Tertullian, who was prone to be a bit of a curmudgeon. But he did come up with a beautiful image of the Trinity when he thought of it in his own mind as a plant. And he said, imagine God the creator as the deep root and out of that emerges in time Christ Jesus as this green shoot that breaks into the world and then the spirit is both the fragrance and the fruit that emerges and spreads throughout the world because of the plant that metaphor is tangible yet it remains mysterious and the reality is that's what all good theology is supposed to be now, if a plant metaphor doesn't work for you, another approach is simply to think about the relationships in our lives. We talked earlier about friendship. There's a modern theologian, a woman professor named Sally McFaig, who suggested that we think about God in terms of the relationships we already know and simply enlarge them to include the divine. God as mother, Christ as lover, the spirit as as then friend and friendship. And one other old theologian, a man named Irenaeus, tells us that we should picture the triune God who turns towards the world, and as God does that out of love, the Son and the Spirit become the two arms of God reaching out to hold us and keep us safe in God's embrace. The bottom line is that it's okay not to have precise language when we talk about Jesus Christ or precise limiting language when we talk about God as the sacred trinity. Because to speak about God with absolute concrete precision is to diminish God into our human categories. It is to reduce God to our flimsy words and our transient concepts. God is frankly too big too wonderful, too exuberant for such limits. And besides, if you think about it, we already, through the Spirit's indwelling, have a pretty good sense about what is good and true and beautiful in this life and what is false and broken and ugly. For example, Jesus himself said on the Sermon on the Mount, you will know them by their fruits. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Healthy, humble understandings of God are like bearing good fruit through our actions and our responses, whereas narrow, limiting, divisive language about God 
is destined only to bear bad fruit. And if that's true for individuals, it's especially true for communities and denominations and nations as well. A hundred years ago, the social gospel writer Walter Rauschenbusch said that an unchristian social order makes good people do bad things. But a Christian social order has the capacity for even bad people to do what is good. Faith is actually pretty straightforward. Do good. Don't do evil. Believe in the God who made us, who chose to be revealed in this Christ, who models how to live together beyond any fear of death, and trust in the Holy Spirit that will guide us forward in this joyful dance of freedom and peace and purposeful relationships. And in effect, that's what Jesus said in this little passage we heard from John 16. He started by saying, I have a lot to tell you, but I know you won't fully understand it now. But the Holy Spirit, now the Greek word for that is paraclete, which means the one who is called to walk beside us. Jesus says the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth and will declare for you what is good to know about me and about our parent, God. So, if I've only confused you more, you're certainly welcome to come to my office and we can talk more about this. I'm more than happy to do that, but recognize I probably won't have a real precise, concrete answer for your questions. I, too, struggle with how do you reduce the mystery of Jesus the Christ down to human concepts, especially when his story involves miracles and the Easter morning events of resurrection. But none of that is a reason to step away from the church. Rather, it's always meant to be a call to step deeper into church, to challenge this congregation and all congregations should they ever become rigid and judgmental in their language about God, and to celebrate with this congregation and all congregations when we join in the joyful mysteries of splashing water on newborn infants and coming together humbly to share a small meal of bread and wine and retell the stories of angel annunciations and stable births and Easter empty tombs and Pentecost flames igniting the lives of the first disciples. None of that is going to make your faith easier to digest, but all of it involves a mystery and a love that is truer than anything else you will encounter in your time here on earth. As good old Irenaeus said long ago, When God looks to us in love, may then Christ the Savior and the Holy Spirit reach out and embrace us and hold us. And that will be when we step into the mystery of God's being, into the loving mystery of God's plan. And that's precisely where God, Creator, Savior, Spirit, calls us to be. Thanks be to God. Amen. In the midst of our doubts, of our questions, If we're really honest with ourselves, we recognize that in some moment, some moments, some flickers, we're aware that this thing that we doubt, that this person that we don't understand is present with us. So I invite you to join me in prayer. Oh, beloved, you whom Jesus called Abba, Daddy. On this day in which a secular world would have us buy cards and gifts, 
to honor fathers. We acknowledge that every day, every day is your day. And so we give you gratitude for the fathers and father figures who loved us, nurtured us, led us by example. And we ask your healing on those paternal relationships which injured us. Redeem our memories. Give us a path to forgiveness. And lead us into peace and wholeness. O oh, precious one, we bring before you concerns of our hearts that before, a and we recognize that before a word is on our tongues, you know it completely. And so, beloved, receive these, our prayers, for those whom we know and love. for our church, our city, our state, our nation. For this world, torn and bloody from war, poverty, and neglect. For this spectacular cosmos with which you have graced us, blessed us, and challenged us. Gather these prayers from our heart to your love that in all cases thy will might be done. And hear us now as we offer familiar words, words that Jesus gave to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. The power and the glory forever. Amen. We have an opportunity to worship God in a very concrete way by giving of the gifts that we have already given. And so I invite you to share of your gifts and your offering this morning in praise and worship.
con ustedes. The Lord be with you. Y también contigo. Levantemos nuestros corazones. Lift up your hearts. Lo tenemos levantado al Señor. Demos gracias al Señor nuestro Dios. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Es justa dar gracias y alabanzas a Dios. We come bearing our gifts, O merciful God. They are but a portion of earth's treasures that you abundantly give us. With them, we also commit our time and energy to be Christ's faithful servants and ambassadors of hope in the world. Bless what we bring and all that we are to your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. We thank our guest musician, Jimmy Cunningham, one more time. <laughs> Faith was never meant to be simple. It was meant to be meaningful. The hope in Christ pulls you into something that's bigger than yourself. That's what gives it its value. And the love of God will hold you no matter where you travel. That's what gives us hope. And the Spirit will guide you into this deeper truth if you let go and follow. Trust then in this mystery and this joyful dance. And may God who created us and the Spirit who guides us and leads us in a communion with the one, the Savior Christ, be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>